GNI is one of half a dozen of what we call multi-stakeholder initiatives that have emerged over the last two decades around the world that bring together companies with different, with different stakeholders to address particularly difficult human rights related issues that companies face for which governments don't necessarily provide the answers and in some ways governments are themselves the problem, at least from a human rights perspective. So there have been similarly um, structured uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives in the extractive sector, oil and gas, uh, in consumer retail, particularly footwear and apparel, uh, and then GNI itself. And we brought together, um, we, there were a couple of dozen uh, individuals representing uh, companies, academic experts, responsible investors and human rights NGOs who came together in calendar years 2006, 2007, and 2008 to see if there was a basis for broad consensus among those different groups to create standards around freedom of expression and right to privacy online with a, a, an initial focus on internet companies, but also with the medium to long-term vision that we would uh, extend to telco companies and mobile communication companies as well across the ICT sector. We were successful uh, by 2008 in developing uh, the GNI principles and implementation guidelines and the, at a very, very broad, quick, high level, what uh, the GNI principles do is they ask companies to minimize uh, constraints on freedom, freedom of expression uh, for users. They ask companies to minimize uh, the extent to which they may be subject to censorship uh, <coughs> from governmental authorities in different jurisdictions. They um, ask companies to minimize the extent to which they are compelled by government authorities to take down certain types of content. And they also ask companies to uh, respect the uh, right to privacy and therefore be transparent about uh, surveillance that they may be uh, party to in connection with mostly national security and law enforcement demands of companies. I want to be very clear that what GNI does not ask companies to do because it wouldn't be realistic is to not have any, not be a party at all to any limitations on uh, freedom of expression or right to privacy. What we're trying to do is to limit the negative impacts on those fundamental rights and to uh, get companies to be accountable and transparent to stakeholders but ultimately to users as to how they uh, uh, deal with those issues. So to get to our theme and then over to Rebecca to explain how Ranking Digital Rights complements uh, GNI, GNI started with uh, just uh, several companies uh, as part of it, um, even though more companies were involved in the original development. But we launched with commitments from Google, Yahoo, and Microsoft. We subsequently added uh, Facebook, which is with us this afternoon, uh, LinkedIn, which as many of you know is subsequently <laughs> been acquired by Microsoft. We then did a very intensive negotiation um, uh, coming off a uh, several year long learning collaboration with the industry dialogue of over half a dozen European telco companies. So, uh, so we welcomed into GNI this March uh, seven of these companies, and the list includes, I think, most significantly from an India perspective, Vodafone, but it also includes uh, Telia, based in Sweden, Telia Nora, based in Norway, Telefonica, based in Spain, uh, and several others, uh, Orange of France. Um, and we also are in conversations with BT and others. Um, but we have focused on the core issues around privacy and surveillance and uh, expression and um, uh, censorship.
and, and very significantly, as you would imagine, the last several years in the context of extremist content online. And that, of course, is a very salient issue in India throughout South Asia, but of course it's a salient issue globally, not least in North America and Europe, for obvious reasons dealing with terrorism and national uh, security concerns. But we have also begun to focus in the last 12 to 18 months very seriously on network shutdowns. And that's partly due to the fact that GNI now includes these seven telcos that are uh, in the firing line more than the ISPs on network shutdowns, but it also reflects our view that network shutdowns present a very, very serious threat to civil society, to human rights, but also have very negative impacts, economic impacts on local communities and national economies. The telcos originally, these European tel group of, of telcos that formed the industry dialogue, did so in part because Vodafone was being forced to shut down in Egypt, mm -hmm. Telia Sanara was being forced to comply with all kinds of government requests in Central Asia that were you know, not good for human rights. And they, did, they couldn't act alone. That, that, that they felt they needed to get together. And I, I heard, I, I think that it was the gentleman from, from Jaipur was talking about, you know, the ISPs maybe need to get together more to figure out what to do. This was the ISPs in Europe figuring out, okay, we're facing all these government demands and we can't act separately. We need to come together and figure out what are our core principles, what are our core responses, what are our common exactly. responses to the way in which governments are demanding. Moving on to ranking digital rights. So I was involved with the formation of the Global Network Initiative. Um, and um, I, I tend to feel that the Global Network Initiative, by establishing some baseline principles and standards, particularly around how companies handle government demands, um, sometimes it's hard to tell kind of what impact the GNI has had. From looking at it the inside, I've tended to feel that it's sort of like, what if you didn't have air traffic control? How many people would have died? You don't know. But I think things would have been a lot worse in, in terms of uh, the way in which companies were dealing with, have been dealing with government demands around the world of different kinds. Uh, not that things are necessarily great the way they are now, and, you know, but but I, I think it has established kind of a floor uh, below which things have not gotten, at least for some of the, the biggest uh, internet platforms. Um, but I started ranking digital rights really uh, actually out of frustration um, because I wanted to push the, the companies and other stakeholders to go farther. Um, the, the companies were committing to doing due diligence around government demands and they were committing to do a number of things. They were starting to issue transparency reports and, and releasing data about government demands for, for user data to take down content and so on. But I thought that not all the transparency reports were equally good and not all the company practices were equally uh, robust. Uh, but GNI didn't have a mechanism to publicly compare. Um, and so I thought we needed, uh, we needed a framework to compare very publicly which company is, has better transparency reporting than which, um, and also to start comparing, uh, bringing in some comparisons with companies that are not in the GNI, that, are, that had, did not participate in the industry dialogue, and see how their practices and policies compare you know, across the board, sort of across a global set of companies so, so that people can kind of see, the, com compare the differences themselves. And it's, again, a very fairly low baseline. We're just looking for what companies disclose about their commitments and about their policies. And not just about government demands, but how, what are they doing to enforce terms of service? Are they being transparent about that? Are they mm -hmm. being transparent about commercial data collection and sharing? Uh, and so on. And, and so you can go to rankingdigitalrights.org and see how various specific companies um, uh, perform. We do have one Indian telco in the India index, Bharti Airtel, uh, and, and we, we uh, evaluate Airtel India specifically. Uh, and uh, moving to the network shutdown, we're, we ask 35 different questions. So we're, we're looking at a lot of things, both around governance, you know, does the, com does the company have core commitments to users' rights? Is, are, is there executive and management accountability 
around these issues? Is there impact assessment? Is there grievance and remedy? And then we also look at a number of questions around freedom of expression, transparency, and a commitment uh, around both blocking and takedowns and shutdowns. And then we have a, a series of questions about privacy and security related policies. But we have one question, one indicator in the 35, looking specifically at how transparent are these companies about their policies related to network shutdowns. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, across the board, the transparency is not good. Um, uh, you know, of, of the possible 100% score, you know, the, the, the highest is, is kind of, yeah, is well, yeah, 67 overall, but, but uh, with the shutdowns, it's even lower. Um, and, um, you know, with, with the telcos, the, the problem with being transparent, of course, is that a lot of government requirements don't allow the telcos to report how many shutdown requests did I receive, how many did I comply with, yeah. how many did I push back on. However, um, so Vodafone, for example, which operates in India, um, they do disclose some basic information about their commitment to push back on overbroad requests. Uh, and they do disclose some basic information about the types of circumstances under which they may comply with, uh, under which their network might get shut down, and the types of circumstances under which certain applications might get blocked. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so they, they disclose some information, and Airtel discloses a lot less information. And we actually, we, worked, we work with people, with different researchers around the world, and we have a partnership with uh, CIS, the Center for Internet and Society, and they did some analysis and they were like, there, there's no legal reason in India why, okay, maybe you can't disclose the specific orders you got, but, but you can disclose some basic things about the circumstances under which you might shut down networks and you know, give users more information about the context. Um, and, you know, and then the other thing is that you know, are, the, are the companies engaging with stakeholders to, to try and and perhaps improve the policy. Uh, Bennett, I do want to ask you, since you've, you've worked with companies and analyzed um, government requests from across the world, from the US, UK, Europe, everywhere, um, how do Indian companies and Indian governments handle internet shutdowns differently from the rest of the world? Look, I don't want to make a judgment on that. I'm, you know, uh, not an expert on the situation in India, but I'm certainly aware, as we all are uh, in GNI, that there has been a significant uh, incidence of network shutdowns in India. We've seen in India, as we've seen in many other countries around the world, a increase uh, in network shutdowns in the last couple of years. And it's a particularly disturbing trend in to see in such a uh, the largest democracy in the world, such with such a extraordinarily vibrant tech sector and vibrant um, civil society. So, to us, it's a it's a disturbing trend. But I don't want to single out India. We see this all over the world um, in in democracies and non democracies alike. Um, point though, I want to make about India the quickly then pivot to the broader proposition we're trying to get for get across with GNI, and then turn back to you, is that we do think that it would be useful in India, and I want to emphasize in India and in other countries, for there to be dialogue among different stakeholders about um, why network shutdowns may be necessary at some, at some, in some contexts, sort of criteria or rules of the road that might limit them uh, and hold those accountable for them. Uh, and the dialogue that we just had 20 minutes here ago, uh, thanks to our colleague from Jaipur, you know, is exactly the kind of dialogue that really needs to be facilitated on a more formal basis, not only in India, but in many other countries around the world. So GNI would like to see itself on a global basis, and that could include India, as facilitating discussions as to 
um, the drivers of network shutdowns, but also their implications, their negative effects on human rights, on civil society, their economic um, uh, effects. Uh, just a couple of other quick points in that regard. Uh, G and I uh, worked together with Deloitte in putting together a study with Deloitte as well as the Brookings Institution, the policy research think tank based in Washington, D.C., showing the economic impact uh, of uh, shutdowns. And Facebook was also involved in uh, commissioning and supporting that study. And uh, the top line result is quite staggering, which is um, that uh, high connect connectivity countries lose at least 1.9% of daily GDP each day that services are blocked. That is a staggering, staggering figure. GNI is not just a multi-stakeholder standard setting initiative. It also is a policy and advocacy platform bringing together different stakeholders with companies. And so GNI has decided in the last year that it would try to be a voice on network shutdowns. So if we put together for the first time earlier this year a joint statement including all of GNI, but specifically including internet companies and telcos for the first time expressing grave concerns about network shutdowns, both in terms of their economic costs and their human rights implications. And it shows a sort of unity of view, of viewpoint uh, within the sector, but also more generally with the constituents that we mobilize through GNI. And we're hoping that our work will put a spotlight more in India and elsewhere globally on the costs and consequences of network shutdowns. Um, Rebecca, I want to come back to you quickly on uh, so the, the score that you give uh, to uh, business entities, which would include internet companies and telcos, on corporate accountability, would the split, um, say Google here scores a 65, um, would it score differently in different economies? Say, in, say a country which is not really a market priority for Google, say in Iraq, would it score any differently than it would in the US? That's a good question. Um, because we're looking at their global policies on the mm -hmm. internet um, platforms and we're looking at fairly high level disclosure, um, it would probably score relatively consistently. With the telcos, however, because the, t the operating companies have very different policies in different places. So Vodafone UK and Vodafone India don't have exactly the same policies, or Vodafone <laughs> Egypt. And, and so one would expect them to, to score fairly differently. Whereas Google, you know, for, for the internet platforms, their policies tend to be more similar. Um, and we are just looking at disclosures. We're not looking at you know the number of requests that they're complying with or something. Right. Um, we're looking at whether they disclose the number of requests they're com complying mm -hmm. with. So, so I think there need to be a separate layer of research, country, country by country, and we're actually encouraging researchers in different countries to do that kind of research, to mm -hmm. do more comparative, like what's going on at the country level. Because there is a difference, uh, I mean, which is why you would. Sure. Yeah, yeah, and and since we we can't kind of cover absolutely everything everywhere, we're looking more kind of for for the telcos. We look at their kind of group level policies, and then their home country operating co company, um, and then for the internet companies, since they tend to have more global policies, we we look at their global policies. Mm -hmm. um, but it is true that you know there because the companies are complying with different types of law, right? So Google in Thailand is removing lots of things that are visible in the United States um, because the law is different. So they're, they're complying with different laws. So it's kind of the intersection of the policies with the national law has different results in, in terms of what happens to users' access to information because these companies are being required to to comply with the local laws. And the question is how transparent are they being with users about what's happening? Um, and a, again, there's there's different different levels of transparency there. Uh, Bennett, you had mentioned earlier that um, in the beginning, in the initial few years of uh, GNI, you had trouble signing up telcos from the uh, Europe, US, and the UK. Uh, why were they inhibited? 
Um, that's a, a hard question, and I'll be candid, and I'm not very happy about my answer. Um, I think it's a fair observation that for the half a dozen or so multi-stakeholder initiatives out there, and I mentioned that there are ones that are similarly constructed in the extractive sector, oil and mining, and consumer retail, footwear and apparel, uh, that the uh, initiative has tended to come from a combination of Western-based, North American or European-based NGOs and companies. And I really emphasize the NGOs that have really put the spotlight uh, on corporate conduct in ways that have made it important to those companies to set some standards and then abide by them. So those pressures and expectations, um, while they're present globally, I think it's fair to say uh, the last two decades have been more focused coming from the UK, Europe, and North America. That's changing though, uh, and we have an increasing number of South country participants in GNI. We do not yet have any South-based companies, the time will, is, is here for that. I'm hoping that we'll have several by the year 2020, but I'm, I'm really pleased to say that we've got three GNI participants uh, from uh, South Asia, two from India. We've got the Center for Communications Governance at National Law University here in Delhi as part of the GNI academic constituency. We've got the Center for Internet and Society in Bangalore. Uh, as part of our uh, NGO constituency. And then some of you, excuse me, are familiar with Bolo B, uh, the Pakistani uh, NGO, which is quite prominent internationally as well, that's also part of our NGO constituency. I will tell you honestly that um, the, the, the issues have been not just, a, there was a perception on the part of the European companies in particular that GNI was a made in the US initiative, which is not quite fair, but perceptions become reality. The fact is, is that we had several of the telcos, the European telcos, in our original dialogue in 2006, 2007, 2008. But I would also acknowledge that uh, there was a perception on the part of the telcos, which had some merit to it, that the internet companies were more in the driver's seat, and that's not because they were trying to be more powerful, but it's because the issues that were on the table for the most part in the 2006, 7, 8 period f focused heavily on censorship and expression, and frankly, heavily on those issues as they play out in China. So there was a sense on the part of the European telcos that there was a kind of imbalance of focus from their perspective. But we've come a long way since then, and we now cover uh, companies on both sides of the Atlantic and in the telco sector. We're going to be moving, we hope, to mobile communications, but I cannot emphasize enough the importance that we attach to bringing in South Country companies in addition to NGOs, academics, and investors. The internet shutdowns that we, we discussed in the um, earlier session, um, most of them were uh, brought in to contain a law and order situation. Um, and if there is a rumor being spread somewhere um, on a particular platform, um, it is possible to take legal action uh, with MLATs, and which the governments have been um, so far not very keen on using. Is there something that the MLAT process is lacking? Uh, is it lacking somewhere where the governments uh, are not encouraged enough to employ them with the kind of frequency they should be? Yeah, so th there are efforts to reform the MLAT process, and, and GNI and its members have been involved with many of these discussions. The treaties that enable, basically, governments to, to request data and sort of goes through the United States, in this case, with, with, the, with the U.S. platforms. Uh, and, and they're very unwieldy, and they take a long time, so governments don't want to use them. Um, and um, there's, there's a concern that if, if the process is not reformed so that it works a little bit better for legitimate law enforcement and national security cases, because there are a lot of 
legitimate cases where you know there's a murder case that you're trying to solve or 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 other other you know serious situations um, that uh, that there there needs to be um, some process that works and that M MLAT doesn't work in those cases. But there's it's it's difficult because on the human rights side, you know how do you how do you create a mechanism that won't be abused um, to to deal with people who might be considered criminals in one country, but by human rights definitions, they're not. They're maybe dissidents <laughs> or, or government critics or something. Um, so so it's it's fraught with with a lot of debate. But um, I mean, this is this is the problem with you have a patchwork of of governments uh, and different legal regimes. Uh, and you have these companies that are trying to figure out how to adhere to some common standards, and and that often clashes. But I mean, this is the thing: is that there are legitimate reasons for law enforcement, um, for public order. The question is, how do you make sure that the power being exercised is not abused? Yeah. Um, and that doesn't result in the government becoming less accountable. To the people, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's what we need to to really guard against. Yeah. Or are companies becoming less accountable to right. the public, and right. and so it, this is a global problem. Yeah. So GNI is multi-stakeholder, right? So where does uh, you know telcos? Where do telcos and ISPs have the most you know obstruction and say, okay, we are not going to yield an inch on this issue? We have a particularly difficult time uh, figuring out within GNI how companies can adhere to the GNI principles operating in China. And I shouldn't just single out China. There are other countries that are very, very difficult. But uh, there's a real open question uh, that some would answer, give the answer no. Uh, if the question is, is it possible to operate in China? with such a comprehensive and invasive uh, degree of both surveillance and censorship, is that is it possible to really be true to GNI in that circumstance? And <clears throat> we uh, have that discussion and frankly debate within GNI, and it's a running difficult question. There are other issues that we um, uh, cannot necessarily agree on within GNI. One that I can just mention publicly is the, an issue that has some human rights implications, some expression implications, but we've decided that it's just not in our core terrain, partly because we can't get a consensus around it, and that is what we call net neutrality. That's a, a concept that was defined really in yeah. a U.S. context that has to do with yeah. uh, the degree of regulation that permits um, access by consumers and users yeah. to content across platforms. That's a huge oversimplification, yeah. but that's an area where there are differences between the ISPs and the telcos that we can't reconcile. But what I would say, just in answer, ending my answer, because we'll go have limited time and a few other questions, is that we have found in GNI that uh, the commonalities between the ISPs and the telcos are greater than the differences, even though there are some differences. And there is growing common ground in terms of basic issues around expression and privacy, but also increasingly network shutdowns. And the reason there's that common ground is not just because the companies feel that way, it's because they're beginning to perceive on the basis of their users, their customers, that there is growing anxiety and expectation around these issues. So that's why we're able to come together, and even if we can't solve all these problems or even address them, at least we have some common ground that we think that we can move forward together around. So my first question is for Rebecca, um, and I just kind of want to um, go back to the RDR, um, methodology and how it actually has uh, enabled companies like Twitter to become more forthcoming about um, disclosures and when they are acting on government requests. And we've seen that, particularly in the context of India, that Twitter has proactively over the last few years uh, expanded on the categories that they include in their transparency report. But in the context of um, content restriction, 
we see that now there is transparency, but that still does not prevent companies from complying. And in fact, transparency in some way gives, creates a little bit of a roundabout where they're saying, but we are transparent about it. And that's what so our So how transparent is. are the transparency reports, basically? I mean, so it's trans beyond transparency, and we're kind of trying to create similar standards for internet shutdowns. So if we were to make ISPs or TSPs become more vocal and transparent about the orders that they are receiving, um, would it again face similar issues um, that we have dealt in the context of content um, policy disclosures? And how would we kind of preempt that and work around that from the beginning? And my second question is to Bennett. Um, so for the Cameron shutdowns, a lot of governments came together with the suggestion that um, there should be a sanction on um, the government uh, if they're restricting access. And um, I was kind of wanting to really know what GNI thinks about this development and what could be some of the repercussions of uh, multilateral action on this. Because we see access-related provisions also entering in trade agreements now, uh, both at the regional and the plurilateral level. So kind of... Okay, long question. Can we have two very brief answers? Sure. Yeah. Um, just to, to speak, transparency is necessary but insufficient. So I, I tend to view the ranking digital rights index as like this is like the minimum that companies should be doing just to be able to enable a conversation about these other things. But if they're not even telling us what they're doing, then it's hard to have a conversation about whether they're doing the right thing and then how they're interacting with the governments. We also need better government transparency about the demands they're making. We need laws that enable transparency. But beyond transparency, you also you know, need, need to, to have basic commitments. You have to have impact assessment and other things that we look at. So I guess you know, to, one could go on at great length and happy to talk more later. Uh, but I, I really view the ranking digital rights kind of framework and I think GNI as well, as this is, it's the floor, not the ceiling. It's just trying to get everybody above the floor so that we can then progress from there, mm -hmm. rather than saying, oh, once you get to these standards, everything is going to be solved. Yeah. And, and that's not the message. So I, I don't really see um, much likelihood in the near term of sanctions, say, for multilateral institutions for network shutdowns. That said, there could be a basis for sanctions in the sense that network shutdowns constrict commerce, economic activity, and therefore create trade barriers. And if those trade barriers are created um, among companies that have bilateral or multilateral trade agreements, there could be sanctions. And in fact, GNI has pointed that out uh, in some of our work. But I'm not optimistic that that's going to happen anytime soon. And I don't want to get into the broader subject, uh, the, the whole broader geopolitical context, but I guess I can't resist. And that is that the, Uni <coughs> the United States, um, which has really been the primary architect um, of the international trading regime, is now taking a very different approach uh, in the new administration in ways that are degrading uh, the integrity of the WTO, and, and they've already torpedoed the TPP. Uh, so I don't see the U.S., at least, um, contributing in this way, and that doesn't mean that other uh, countries can't or won't, but I'm very worried about the decay of the multilateral trading system, and that goes beyond our focus today, but it does relate to your question. Uh, I'm frankly, and I'll just add one more sentence, which really has nothing to do with the conference, but I can't resist, and that is I'm very worried about the um, overall uh, negative impact that the new U.S. administration is having on international institutions, standards, and norms, not least with respect to human rights across the board. But we can have another conference just on that subject, and um, uh, happy to talk about that later. Almost like an add-on to uh, to Jyoti's first question. Uh, wanted to understand if so. One of the things that we heard in the in, in, in the first session was about how there have been uh, informal internet shutdowns, which are not disclosed or not by order, just by a phone call. Uh, is that something that you've seen across the world? And are telecom operators and ISPs be, being transparent about that? 
because they are our only source of information when the government isn't. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And, and really one of the reasons why GM, GNI was formed was a case with Yahoo, well, well, Yahoo receiving orders from the Chinese government to hand over user information, but also Microsoft shutting down somebody's blog on the basis of an informal phone call from one authority to a subsidiary working with Microsoft. And the argument from civil society and others was, it's one thing to comply with the law, but you weren't even in complying with the law, you were complying with an informal conversation. And you need to have standards um, that okay, if the, if they if they give you a formal legal order, okay, but but none of this complying with phone calls between friends or something, um, and and so that that's one of the one of the standards, um, and one of the ways in which I, I think GNI has helped I think at, at least with some companies and and how they handle their relations with governments is that they now make a commitment that they're going to have their lawyers, you know, if something is not in writing, they don't respond to it. Um, and they have their lawyers look at it. And, and that's the expectation within GNI if a, if a member company is living up, is complying, you know, basically with, with its commitments under GNI is, is that, okay, we understand there's law you need to comply with. But if you're complying with what are effectively private requests, because if they're not official requests, they're private requests, yeah. and and you're doing it on the basis of no legal procedure, that's so the ex that's the extra legal behavior, and and it it's it's not accountable, and it and it doesn't have place within, uh, you know, a, a human rights framework. So in, in the U.S., uh, say, requests or, or orders from the FISA court, um, they, they wouldn't be, telcos or internet companies wouldn't be able to disclose any of that. that. Well, right, that's a problem. And, uh, those would be written orders. Those are written orders, yeah. They're, they're, they're not getting verbal telephone calls right. from, you know, a friend of the, the police to, you know, somebody's subsidiary. They're getting legally binding communications. Now, what's unfortunate is the lack of transparency around that. And, you know, there's, there's plenty of, of people doing good work trying to impose greater transparency and greater accountability um, on that process. Um, and it's, it's true the companies aren't able to disclose it um, because of the law. Uh, but we are looking for maximum disclosure. You know, I anything that the law doesn't prevent you from disclosing, hmm. it, you should be disclosing unless there's a privacy reason or, or some other, uh, other, you know, very legitimate kind of human rights reason. Um, hi, thank you so much for the um, interventions. Um, I work at a think tank in New Delhi, and um, we have been working on um, reforming the mutual legal assistance um, process right now between US and India. Um, and something that we learned from our interviews with law enforcement officials is that they felt that um, Indian representatives of a lot of these internet companies uh, didn't have a lot of agency. Um, for instance, we learned that um, when a video was being circulated during these riots in UP, um, that the company in question didn't want to bring it down because it didn't attract the US hate speech um, law, for instance. So those are two different problems, that there are US laws in play, um, but I was wondering whether you thought it's important for uh, Indian offices to have more agency, like the corporate accountability that you spoke of. Um, do you think that should be a parameter that it be decentralized as well? Well, it's it's, it's difficult, um, and and I think I think these multinational companies face a um, a difficult balance in that regard. I think um, kind of thinking about how th how this has evolved over the past ten years. Um, I know particularly in the case of China, um, th companies were finding that if they had, if, if they kind of set a rule for their local office to say, you know, if the, if the authorities are coming to you about this, you have to escalate it to the head office, then that makes it easier for the local person first not to be held responsible for saying no um, because they're quite vulnerable. So, so if, if they're being asked to do something that's actually quite violating of human rights, 
you know, assist in surveillance of, an, uh, of a political activist and so on. If the company is ba basically has a procedure that says the, the local employee needs to escalate these cases up to, um, uh, up to headquarters, that protects the local employee from, from arrest. Uh, and so there, there have been reasons, I think, why some of these multinationals have, have developed kind of different procedures around what is handled locally and what is handled at the headquarter level. And there's also issues around, you know, what is terms of service versus what is actually a, a, a legal request. Um, but but it's, it's kind of a mess right now because uh, one can relate to, and I've, I've heard these conversations between law enforcement from a range of different countries and companies and human rights groups and you know people in the U.S. about how difficult it is to 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 deal with genuinely problematic, dangerous cases locally. Um, while at the same time you have a situation where a local employee in, in some countries is, is under physical threat by authorities. Um, and and so, so companies have very conflicting obligations and international law isn't helping us with this um, and kind of domestic laws all conflict. And in, in an ideal world, if all governments or most governments were actually had laws that were consistent with human rights standards, then it would be, of course, very easy. Then I, I think we would see very quickly a situation where it would be easy to de decentralize this. But where, where you have a situation where the head, head office did some due diligence around under what circumstances um, you know, is, is speech uh, you know, does the government censor speech under blasphemy laws or other, you know, is, is there criminal liability for libel in a particular country? And if there is, then, then there's going to be much more reluctance to have something handled at the local level because there will be fear that, that, that human rights violations could potentially occur because the legal framework isn't in line with human rights standards. Not that you know, uh, not saying that any particular legal framework is pristinely great, but but companies do do this kind of assessment when deciding how they're handling these things. Um, and and this is, yeah, how how we work through this is is difficult. And it, it seems that kind of at the nation state level and kind of the international law level, we just don't have the right mechanisms to arrive at processes that really address the legitimate law enforcement and public safety concerns while also protecting human rights, you know, freedom of expression and privacy of users globally. It's, it's like completely broken globally. And um, yeah, it, we've got, it, there's, there's a lot of work to do on a lot of levels.